Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Chaotic Stupid Podcast. Uh, this is Mike, and I'm here with my friend Mark Stewart. Hey, Mike. Good to be here. Yes, it is good to be here, isn't it, Mark? <laughs> so this is Mark's first podcast ever, isn't it, Mark? Yes. Yes, it is. So Mark's a game designer. Uh, we work together uh, at Bionic Games. Yep. Uh, so Mark, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you're what, you know, the different places that you worked and the different projects you've worked on? Well, I started out at Bionic Games. Uh, Mike kind of took me in under his wing and uh, gave me my first uh, junior design position there, where I uh, worked on Spyborgs, everyone's favorite Wii brawler about spy cyborgs. So far, three out of the four people on this podcast have worked on Spyborgs. <laughs> Because I've had Tony and Jucket and you. Okay. Right? So, so then, the entire audience out there must now really know everything about Spyborgs. Yes. I think okay. we've even shown the Team Alpha Go video during Ryan's. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's out there. So Spy does that mean it's thing. going to be flying off the shelves now? Well, I don't think it's on the shelves anymore. <laughs> I don't think it's been on the shelves since about three months after it came out, has it? Uh, but that, but you know, that was a good first job. Right? It was an excellent first job. Uh, following, uh, my work on Spyborgs, I actually went to, uh, Disney Interactive, where I was a designer there. And, uh, that was interesting being on the publisher side. So there I spent my time not really working on a single title, but actually doing more consulting work on other games that they were doing. And uh, there, that was interesting. Depending on the project, either it would just simply be checking builds and design docs as they came in and just basically telling the higher-ups, yes, this looks like a game design. Uh, here are some things in the design that might be an issue down the road. We should probably look into those. Um, and other times, it was a lot more hands-on. Uh, actually, I worked on Camp Rock 2, the final jam. Oh, uh, yes. I remember Camp Rock yes, 2. Yes, yes. Uh, that they was a Game Boy game. Yeah. <laughs> DS. Well, I, yes. I count it as a Game Boy. That that was the uh, the rhythm and music game where they could only license five songs and couldn't put non-licensed music in there, so they had to figure out how to fill the rest of the time. And how did they fill the rest of the time? Uh, with a canoeing game and a surprisingly robust uh, water balloon game. Oh, right. Was that the one that had Sarah Palin's face? Yes, Sarah, Sarah Palin's floating head that would uh, start spitting fireballs at people. And they didn't understand why that wasn't shippable? No, so yeah. they sent me to China to help out on that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we're definitely going to have to talk about working for a publisher because you're the first person besides me on the show who's worked as a designer for a publisher. Yeah, which, as I'm sure you can uh, say, is awesome. There's yeah. a lot of great things about there, but you also miss... A, having the hands-on approach with everything, and B, kind of being the villain at times. Right, yeah. Well, I guess if you're on the publisher side and you're going to a developer and telling them bad news, then that's villainous. Uh, let me use it in Star Wars terms. You're kind of Darth Vader at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you're right, it's like, oh, here's the guy from the publisher. Well, you see, they always loved me when I'd come in, though. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't Darth Vader. And, and I guarantee everyone on Bespin loved Vader. <laughs> So uh, after after Disney Interactive, what'd you yeah, do? Yeah, uh, uh, after Disney Interactive, I went to Insomniac Games. And Insomniac have, Games, I've heard of them. Yeah, no, no, they're fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I've been there ever since. Uh, I worked on uh, uh, Overstri Overstrike Turn Fuse. Uh, uh, and yes. since then, I worked on uh, Sunset? Sunset Overdrive. Yes, I was uh, heading up the mission team on that. Nice. And uh, now I am working on our... Uh, the Oculus title, Edge of Nowhere. Oh, you're working on that? Yes. Oh, I, Al Geyer's leading that one, yeah? yeah well, uh, yes, he's creative director. Nice. I am leading the you're Burbank leading design the... team. <gasps> yes. Oh, my little Mark is all grown up. I am. Here, fist bump. You Boom. guys can't see that, but we totally it. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> so, uh, oh, you're leading that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, what, are, you, are you leading one of the specialist teams or the generalist design team? D uh, generalist design team. Nice. So. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Okay, I, one in more fact, fist bump. I am leading... The design team on Burbank. We have two guys over in North Carolina, and we've got the rest uh, over here in uh, Burbank. Cool. All we'll of us talk about that too. wearing rifts on our faces, staring into the void. It must be really hilarious to come in and just see a bunch of people staring into their VR goggles. It's it's a little creepy because I, I I'll like walk in with my coffee, and just half the team will just be staring straight through me. <laughs> um, 
Yes, we'll also have to talk about working on VR and how that's different. Yes, so. it's uh, quite quite exciting. And I must point out that none of the views that I share here are officially uh, Insomniac's views. Yes. Or supported by Insomniac in any way. That is important that you all understand <laughs> that nothing that Mark says here is anything that Insomniac would say. <laughs> Period. Yes. Yes. But uh, no, Insomniac is a fantastic company. Uh, it was fantastic when I worked for them too. So. Still is. It yeah. is the uh, number twelve best uh, small to medium uh, workplace. Good times. Yeah, ju- just won that again for uh, I don't know how many years running, but quite a few. Yeah, I, I I was there when we won it the first time. That was uh, surprising, and then not surprising because we won it, but surprising because no video game company had ever won it before. Mm-hmm. Then we won it a bunch more times, and it's like, well, yeah, of course we won it. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, like just like we've won it all the other years. But yeah, they're they're especially for the kitchen, man. Oh, the kitchen is still fantastic. Oh, Legendary. Oh, my God. Seriously. I remember hearing one time they spend something like $15,000 a month on the kitchen. It might even be more now. I I, I don't know the actual figures. Actually, they recently showed us the figures versus our, like, our general budget. And turns out it's actually fairly reasonable what we well, spend yeah. on it. But by God, well, is it nice what, after a long, hard people? day? You know, when, when you're putting in those extra hours to balance things, it's like, I know there's muffins in there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. It made a lot of difference. Well, because from... I went from Insomniac's Kitchen to uh, you get free sodas at the vending machine, but get your own snacks. Okay. Right? That was my next one. And then I went to Bionic after Oh, that, yeah. The Bionic Kitchen. Which was only the vegan-friendly snacks and no sodas provided. The, so, so the best part about being a junior designer at uh, Bionic was when HR said, we need somebody to help stock the kitchen. We're willing to pay you an extra stipend and not tell you specifically what to get. Oh, okay. So that meant I was actually making an extra chunk of change just to make sure everyone was eating the pumpkin loaf I wanted to eat for breakfast. Oh, well, that's good. Yes. That's that's slick, Mark. Good I, job. I didn't know. I didn't know you had a little deal going on under the <laughs> table there. I just thought she was pressing you into service. <laughs> oh, yeah. All, all I had to do is complain. It's like, oh, I guess I have to go get the food now. Yeah. Darn. But yeah, the, the vegan thing got a little awkward because I remember when at one point like we weren't supposed to have coffee creamer. Oh, because yeah. that, that might be unfair to people that are lactose intolerant. Yeah. Well, that would be very unfair. Yes. So, uh, let's see. So, the kitchen, do they still have the pinball machines? They do not have the pinball, not the pinball machines. machines. They, they do not have the pinball machines. They don't let you play with their pinballs anymore? No. Nope. That um, was a big selling point for a while. But, uh, yeah, no, we, we, still, we still do insomniac events. We got the Friday lunch. We had the... I remember we bought the pinball machines because we were going to make a pinball game. And it never got made. I remember hearing about that it was, game. It was I know infamous, nothing about yeah. it other than like somebody uh, showed me some of the artwork for it, and I'm like, "That's gorgeous." It was really gorgeous. Yeah, I remember. Uh, you, you remember Craig Goodman? Have you ever? Of he's course. in. He's in. Uh, he's in uh, North Carolina. Yeah, good he's guy. One of my favorite uh, uh, insomniac artists. Like, just he's great guy, and everything that he does is gorgeous. Right? He did the uh, uh, some of the pinball table art in that one, if not all the pinball table art. And they were really intricate. Like they were trying to go for real. Uh, uh, real detail there. It was cool. But yeah, so it's too bad. No more pinball machines. Oh, well. Uh, let's see. So uh, let's talk about what it's like working for a publisher as opposed to a developer. Because it is different. It's a lot different. Yes. Uh, now, I worked for a developer first, then went to work for a publisher. But for you, you only had that little stint on Spyborgs and then... Publisher then, time for a while, pu- right? Publisher, uh, yeah. Now, I mean, certainly, like, Spyborgs, toward the end, got a little crunchy. What? I'm just, I'm just saying. I wouldn't say a little crunchy. I would probably say death marchy. Yes, yes. Hey, I, I was lucky. You sent me home at 3, so I could see you again at 8 o'clock when you were still at your desk. Well, I asked them to lay me off early, so I didn't have to work those <laughs> last few weeks. So... You got all that work. <laughs> so it, it, it evened out eventually, it, I think. It, it, it evened out. Um, but g- going to a publisher, publishers, for the most part, keep uh, far more regular hours. Um, and when w- I remember at Disney at one point, they're like, yeah, we, we, we got to stay till eight tonight. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh, are, are you serious? <laughs> um, yeah. And, and then whereas at, whereas at a developer, it's like, well, I'm going to leave at eight tonight. Is that okay? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll be back in at 11. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember I remember it on, on Spyborgs when Scriptgate happened. Oh, uh, I went out to have dinner with my sister, 
and everything exploded while I was gone. <laughs> and uh, I had to go back into the office at like 2 a.m. and try to get my, stop my friend from being fired. Oh. Yeah, that was fun. Um, yeah. So, so there's a lot less of that at a publisher. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, a gr- that's true. You know, as I say, you're working, at least the way Disney Interactive worked, uh, you're working on a lot more projects at once. Um, Mm -hmm. I believe I had a stable of five projects at any time uh, that I was working on. And as I say, a lot of it was more uh, consulting work. Um, There are some games that are like absolute dreams that basically they'll work themselves out, basically. Yeah, so you're not necessarily working on the successful stuff. Yeah. Because that's the stuff that's being successful. Right exactly. Now. You know, you, you'll, you'll have a title that's coming out that's like uh, the the fourth Disney Sing It game. The company that's been making Disney Sing It crafted the formula that they always sell. They're really good at what they do, which is a singing game. So leave them alone. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if broke. So, so yeah, you, you get you get to play the builds, make some notes about anything that you're concerned about, things like that, any suggestions, and then there are the titles that uh, genuinely either the publisher potentially has pledged more than they're able to do, or ge- genuinely, uh, when you're dealing with licensed properties, sometimes they go with a publisher that's new and does not have this kind of experience. And it's a lot more hands-on reading the design talks, sometimes writing the design talks. Um, oh, for a new developer? Yeah. yeah. So, for uh, for instance, when I was on Camp Rock, like I wrote the designs for the uh, canoeing game and the uh, uh, water balloon game like from the ground up. Um, also wound up actually writing some of the dialogue and whatnot because they just didn't have a script writer. So... Yeah, that the, you end up filling a lot of shoes. Yeah, the publisher, you, you, for you, sure. d- you do whatever you need to do at that point. When I started at Activision, I had a whole bunch of projects like that. And it was always just sort of like, okay, where's the intersection of this game is going to make a lot of money and it's in trouble. Exactly. Right? Because uh, if the game wasn't a huge risk, it's not really worth spending all that extra money on it to try to drag it out of, you know, into greatness if it's not even going to make that much. Exactly. When you could put someone on the... Yeah. So that was something that surprised me when I first started was the... When you're at the developer, it's just the one project. So you're always thinking about how to make that the best thing it can be. Mm-hmm. At the publisher, you actually have to make decisions about where your resources go based on real hard truths. Exactly. And uh, certainly with the uh, with licensed games, that's absolutely the case. Um and I don't mean to imply at any point anyone says, like, just shove it out the door. But when you're doing, dealing with a licensed game, like, we're going to be making a Sunny with a Chance uh, game. This show is popular now and will probably only be popular for another few months. How quickly can we get a DS game out? You know? That's not mercenary at all. So, so your job as the designer is to make sure that it is the best possible design that you can do in three months. In three months, yeah. Um, and Disney actually uh, found a lot of publishers that their entire job... Publishers? Or, sorry, not oh, publishers, okay. uh, developers. Their entire job was basically to create templates for games. That they're like, we can make Mario Party if you want in three months. Just give us the assets and figure and out how we can theme it. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah for me... Uh, so. I was working at Santa Monica Activision, and they didn't do any of the licenses. But I'd still occasionally work, like on, um, like say Cabela's Big Game Hunter. You Those, worked on that? I I no I, I spent like an hour. Okay. Giving feedback on it. That's not really the same thing as working on it. <laughs> but those would actually come through because they were high enough. Exactly. Uh, uh, risks, right? They needed them to be great. But also, that was a developer who was really good at making Cabela's games. So generally. They knew what they were doing. Yeah. And then all of that got taken care of in, in I think, Minneapolis, uh, where the Activision has their license studios. Shortly after I started, uh, the middle fell out of the console market. That ah. was when you couldn't make money off of a license game just by the license Exactly. Anymore. And so you couldn't make those, you know, uh, uh, Pixar games that could, you could make for something like $10, $15 million mm-hmm. and then make back more than that, right? Uh, now... The only things that were making money were the things that were like 50 or $60 million to make. And so all the middle things had to just go away. And so I found myself, instead of having five projects, I had one crucial project, right? Or, you know, two crucial projects. It was stuff like that. Or, hey, we really need you for a week to do this thing, you know? 
So yeah, I toward the end of my stint at Disney Interactive got heavily involved with the Phineas and Ferb franchise. Right, right. Um, and part of that was simply uh, the first Phineas and Ferb game came out, did okay, and it was handled by a very competent publisher, but made a very, very simple game for young kids. Was that uh, High Impact? No, uh, that eventually became High Impact. High Impact uh, I forget the name of the publisher uh, that did the first one. Um, I know Altron did the later ones in Japan. Um, but when we were going in to do the sequel, we now realized that Phineas and Ferb was skewing way older. Um, oh, and we okay. actually had a chance to sell a game that older kids would actually be playing and people with uh, more mature tastes in uh, gameplay. So uh, that was a very hands-on thing, just figuring out how to take the basic template of what the first game was and how do we make it something that, like, if... You, are, you or I, or at least 15-year-old, you and I picked it up, it wouldn't be insulting to us and would actually be kind of fun. Right. Yeah, I mean, when you're making a game for really young kids, mm-hmm. uh, it's a completely different exercise uh, than when you're making games for even kids who are two or three old, years older than that. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a fairly big design shift to go from kids to 15 year olds so so like uh, you know like on spyborgs yeah well like for instance the original phineas and ferb i think uh didn't have any uh platform uh platforming elements like they, that is tough for very little yeah, players. yeah exactly um and also just tonally early on they were like well they're little kids we can't have them falling to their death mm, i see but i mean you ha- you hand an older kid a game with no jumping and platforms and they're like what the hell did i just buy mm. so uh Turns out it actually worked very well for the brand. If they actually fall off platforms, they actually rocket back up on little copters and start back <laughs> uh, beforehand. You yeah, know. It's hilarious. Exactly. Oh, they're, they're safe guys, but, you know, there's some... Uh, shenanigans. Shenanigans going on, not super tricky platforming. And honestly, when in doubt, look to the classics and whatnot. Um, there was always a question of, uh, like in Phineas and Ferb, there's the uh, babysitter. Or not babysitter, the sister that's always trying to bust them for what they're doing. Right, yeah. Um, and the original game had these, like, uh, segments. Uh, oh, like, there was a, constantly a timer before Candace would but, uh, bust you. So we wound up actually making it your health bar, basically. That every time the kids did something dangerous, aka potentially get wounded, she'd become more and more aware of them and she'd try to bust them. Oh, okay. So yeah. when that actually filled in, uh, we'd go to like a different kind of gameplay where you had to avoid getting Evil busted. auto mode. Exactly. Or a uh, uh, Sinistar mode. Yes. I live. <laughs> I hunger. Um, oh. But yeah, so, so uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot of rewarding work when you become heavily involved with these projects and, you know, you really become uh, tied to it. And you... You can forge a great uh, relationship with the team, just as I'm assuming you did with uh, Toys for Bob. Yeah. Well, um, and, and also, uh, uh, it gives you a different perspective than when you've only worked for the developer. Exactly. Because now you understand the what the publisher brings to the equation and why they sometimes make what seem like very weird decisions. And, and there's a little bit of you that when you're a designer for the publisher, your job is to sort of be the filter between those things. Right. You, yeah. you understand where the feedback from the company is coming from, and you need to figure out how the designers on the developer side can actually achieve that. Right. Yeah, without you know? making a bad game. Exactly. Yeah. Like, what can um, we cut? What what can we tweak around? What can we change? Oh, God. I, at I, minimum to make this work. So so with the high impact, um, they went with high impact to do the Phineas and Ferb uh, movie game. And they went with high impact because they all made Ratchet, right? Let's make a Ratchet and Clank game with Phineas and Ferb. Only they also wanted it to be a two-player uh, single-screen co-op. Ow. And... The uh, there were so many meetings where people were just looking at it saying, why doesn't this look and play like a Ratchet game? And the answer is because you wanted it to be single screen co-op. Yeah. You know, if you've got to drag a bot the entire time, you can't have that. We can take elements of that. We can take elements of the gameplay and the weapon wheels and such and figure out how to get that in there. But well, what I mean, you're really you get, going for is Lego Star Wars. You get Ratchet deadlocked, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> and that, that game actually is pretty good. Right. Like, it just... Uh, you know, it wasn't a ratchet game, right? It was what everybody didn't like it for. Like when you look at it now, I think it got like a was 82. was ratchet was ratchet deadlock uh, co op single screen? Yeah, but not all the oh uh, and all the time because uh, you had robots that were constantly. Oh God, with you. yes, I forgot. Yeah, it was a hard game to make, and uh, 
and I think it ended up with like an 82. And I remember being so disappointed because the games before that had all been in the high 80s. <laughs> and this was like the lowest game I'd ever worked on. It's like, oh, that's unfortunate. Damn, I, guess... I made a game that was only pretty good. Well, then I worked on Spyborgs, which <laughs> I think it, I'm, I'm happy that one ended up in the high 60s. You know, I, I was at GDC and somebody actually came to me and told me that they love Spyborgs. Were they from the Europe or the UK? Uh, no. And I'll be honest, he clearly wanted a job. Uh, but that said, he knew enough about it when he was talking to me. I'm sure he played it. He played it? Well, that's more than 2,000 other people did, right? <laughs> or however many we sold, I forget. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing you mentioned when we were talking about your resume was that you were the mission team leader on Sunset, yeah? Yes. So what was that like? What is, what is the mission team and, and what? To, why do you segment a design team into say, a mission team and some other kind of team. So, I mean, that's very interesting because obviously you came from Insomniac um, and Bionic was very much run like Insomniac where um, designers wear many hats. And I, I love that. I, I know there's a lot of places Sony Santa Monica absolutely does not go with that and has a lot of specialist designers. Um, when we started making Sunset Overdrive, it was a game of such enormous scope we had never done an open world game at insomnia yeah, yeah that we kind of had to change a little bit of how we did things um so we decided you know after trying everyone does everything early on to eventually say like okay there's a mission team you are specifically in charge of the narrative missions in the game um each mission designer will get four levels or four missions or so you focus on the content for that and wiring that up um, likewise, like the quests, we had a uh, quest team and thing, and uh, we had a couple of designers that were specifically on challenges. And also we had uh, designers who were just in charge of open world and traversal. Right. Yeah. You know, um, Cam was heading that up, you know, because expecting every designer to be both incredibly uh, astute in our open world uh, design metrics, all of that for traversal and combat um it was just too much you well, know? that i mean we wouldn't have been able to make skylanders if we didn't compartmentalize to that yeah extent too, right? um and yeah. and you know still it was very rewarding because uh every designer had some a number of systems that they were looking after as well you know it wasn't just pigeonholes is it okay to ask how many people were on the team for for uh sunset overdrive no okay then i won't well, honestly because i'm probably going to give you the wrong number oh, okay so uh, uh yeah keep, keep going okay um so yeah so as far as the mission missions as i say it was uh we would be given the story we were told the high level thing that needs to happen here and then basically run wild and figure out how we would do that um and the mini story beats were very much a collaboration between the writers creative directors and the designers just saying like okay so, for instance, um, were you were you producing maps or setups, or what were you producing, <sighs> or both? A little both. So, back on Fuse, like we absolutely did the full layout of every level. Like I, I was doing the space station, and I would like do, an illustrator or something. Uh, there was a little bit of that. We're starting to move a lot more into three D, just because our tools are so good as far as just snapping together three D spaces and being able to prove out and play things so quickly. Um, I know that makes me different than a lot of designers who still love the old paper maps. That's just designers at Insomniac. Yeah, I was. I feel like there's a little bit of old fashioned in there. There's definitely great things that can be gleaned from paper maps. Yeah. But when you can iterate so quickly in 3D and actually get in there and play it. I mean, the fact that I can do good paper maps is probably why I keep getting jobs. Oh, yeah. And so I'm glad I can you do You trained it. me in that. that there you that's go. It's a, that's, a good skill to have. Yeah, it's a good skill to have, and it's how I started out. But most um, people prefer 3Ds these, these yeah. days. Most people work that way. Um, but, I mean, if you don't have that first, right. you know, that, that foundation in thinking about it before to, you to do it. To be able yeah. to actually break down from a higher, higher level literally what everything's going to look like and how it all fits together. It's definitely a good way to learn. Yes. Like if I were teaching a a college class in this i would start with paper maps before we ever got into unity a absolutely um occasionally at some point in production like while, I, while, I, while i've been at insomniac somebody has been like well let's try doing 2d maps now and just see how everything holds up and it's fine it's fine but i've noticed sometimes it takes people 
way longer just to get everything on metric and looking great in Illustrator. Mm-hmm. Because it has had, to look great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, that was th- one that's of the things exactly, I taught you. That, it, it always has to look great. You can't just give someone a rough black and white map and be like, here it is. People yeah. look at it. It's like, eh, it's so angular. What's going on? But no, you put in some little, little fake explosions here. Tiny trees to say this is the forest. Gradients and drop shadows. Oh, God, yeah. People yeah. are like, now, now this, this looks great. Well, one thing I found out it was super useful for was uh, uh, when we would give maps to the environment artists, they yeah. wouldn't get very inspired by it. Right, because they they tend to be very visual people. That's why they're artists, visual mm-hmm. artists, right? So I found that when I would give them impressive looking maps or even frilly 3D maps, right? Yeah. Where, like I would just run some cylinders along the top and have some pipes, and all of a sudden they'd be like, "I understand this now," you know? Like that, it that just is made a lot absolutely sense. still the case. So I would have to learn like uh, how to compose, yep, things and yeah, or, or views. Yep. You, know? you get uh, you give someone pure gray blo- gray box, and they're like, "Ah." Eh, mm-hmm. This space is so empty, I can think of a hundred things to fill it. Whereas if you do add those little touches and whatnot, people are like, oh, I get what it's supposed to be. But I mean, if you're not handing the, if if, if you're not handing the map off to an artist, yeah. you know, putting in the effort to make a final product map is probably not, you know, like doing a, a, a rough up to the point where you go into 3D and ending in 3D and handing that to the artist is right. what I see a lot of people do as a compromise. Or they just start in 3D. Yes. Uh, but um, I, I usually see better results from the people who start conceptually first, but not so, always. J- just going back to pipeline on Fuse, it was 2D and 3D maps that were handed to the artist, and the de- like. Very much part of your designer job was to do the 2D and 3D maps, um, and usually and then, a walk and then through you document too. Walk yeah. through, do- absolutely walk yeah. through document. Uh, chart out the beats. Um, Oh, the beats, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, And then wiring up the enemy setups. On the mission team, it was a little less of the level layout. Now, you did some of that, if necessary. Mm -hmm. But basically, you'd be given the open world, and usually some direction creatively, it's like, this should take place in this area. And you choose a space that works. And the uh, open world team did a great job uh, creating spaces that could accommodate combat, could accommodate... I mean, the it's entire... a good idea. Good reason to have specialists yeah. on that because they can make things exactly. like that. Yeah. In, fa- in fact, er- early on, there was a concept like this is an exploration space, this is a combat space, this is... And then once we created an open world game where you're able to traverse everywhere and the streets were uh, filled with dynamic events that could uh, spawn zombies chasing you everywhere, everything had to accommodate combat. Right. Um, so you would choose the space, you would see how it works for you, and then basically design any specific geo that you need for the mission. So like, for instance, uh, I did the hot dog factory mission where I was basically told you need to get into the hot dog factory and find out, um, or was find the a hot journal. dog factory actually producing beef tubes or was that an, in, uh, euphemism? <laughs> It was not a euphemism. Actually, it wasn't I, like a smut theater or something. No, uh, okay. it somewhere early in production, people were like a hot dog factory. We'll have a hot dog factory, and it wound up being like the weirdest. Uh, like, uh, does it involve a dude in a hot dog suit? <laughs> no. Oh, it, uh, what are the organs that don't do anything anymore? That we just like our appendix. Yeah, vestigial. Yeah, vestigial organ. Like somebody laughed at the word hot dog factory at one point. Uh, because er, like a previous designer early on when we had more instanced interiors, like had conveyor belts and tubes of hot dogs everywhere. Um, eventually we ruled that there'd be almost no interiors in the game, uh, except for a couple of very specific places. So it was hot dog and kind of name only. Okay. We had some crates that would spawn hot dogs and whatnot. Like you Um, do. Yeah. Yeah. But basically like the open world designer said like, here's the silhouette I imagine the hot dog factory will be. And then go in and tweak it to what you need to do. And I was able to uh, work with uh, some fantastic artists to actually get like an interior space so that the idea is you had to get into the factory. But it was more about getting uh, powering up uh, some construction equipment to knock the wall down so you could get in. And it was basically just like a small room inside that you could go to. So it wasn't that much in terms of creating a new space, but yeah, but figuring more working out working within the space. That exactly, you have. and uh, I mean, certainly depending on the designer, there was there was definitely uh, a lot of custom uh, layout work to be done, but not nearly the from the ground up. You know, design a space station. Yeah, yeah. You know? 
Tell you me, know what the shape what of the room is. you think is going to happen in this space e- Exactly. So, uh, for, it was coming up with the actual mission objectives and how each of those would flow into each other and wiring those up. So, if the mission was invade the hot dog factory, yes. you had to come up with a specific bullet points that would get you from not invading a hot dog factory to being inside of a hot dog factory. Exactly. What keeps the, what is keeping the player busy? What are the highs? What are the lows? How many rats do they have to kill? Yes. Well, and uh, that's actually a very good point. One of the things that works very well for um, Sunset Overdrive that kind of characterizes Sunset Overdrive mission uh, design is that each of the missions has kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, a one-off memorable thing. Um, so, like, for instance, the Hot Dog Factory, you know, what makes this mission different from every other mission? Because at the end of the day, Sunset is it the Overdrive hot dog crates. No, no, it, it is not. Because uh, at, at the end of the day, every mission of Sunset Overdrive involves monsters to shoot, things to grind on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like Hot Dog Factory was, you can get inside the crane and operate the crane before you actually smash the wall down. And uh, it basically involved like a cross between uh, a cross between Whack a Mole and uh, the old Turtles in Time uh, Technodrome boss, where you could actually throw people at the screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it was a lot of fun to design. And, like, that that was kind of, like, the unique linchpin here. Or, uh, for instance, there was a mission where you're supposed to retrieve somebody's uh, robotic pet dog. And that actually became a little mini uh, mechanic where you could operate the dog and basically fire treats that would lure him into murder other enemies. Like you do. E- exactly. So, you know, that's it, what's it special ro- about it this It was a mission. robot dog? Or just it was a, a dog? robot dog. So it was like canine. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, I, I believe, uh, Fufu, uh, the uh, robotic dog. And uh, yeah. Affirmative. You, you'd, it was actually the kitty cannon, which would fire uh, little stuffed cats and it would attract the dog. And if there were enemies nearby, it would just totally annihilate them. <laughs> which, like the, like by the, the way, little game the design animals. tip. Uh, when that mechanic started, uh, it really didn't work out well because you can over design stuff. Like, Sat down and in a created a br- brilliant design that was like, okay, it's a dog. What is it like to be walking a dog? Well, you got to keep the dog within range of you at all times. You know, you can't let the dog wander off. Um, we want to make sure that because you're firing the kitty, there's only one kitty in play at all times. And the dog actually has to bring it back to you before you can advance and things like that. In the end, people just want to blow things up in the most fun way possible. We kept stripping it back and back to the point it's like, okay, you get infinite cats. And wherever you fire a cat, the dog will literally zip there at like near teleport speeds and then blow the shit out of them. Like the ant lions. Yes. Yeah. And it was amazing. I'll bet you Valve went through the exact <laughs> process where they're like, oh, well, first we're going to limit the thing. And then, and then eventually it's just, no, murder them with the ant lion. Go for yeah, it. Yeah. And, and it works out great. Yeah. Well, it's like Clank. It's like Clank in Ratchet and Clank, right? Yep. We don't generally make it so that that will block you. It's just kind of a treat. Yep. You get to have all the robots salute at you, and it's adorable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, maybe that's just me. No, no, no. A- absolutely. And yeah, the, the saluting is fantastic. Uh, for me, the saluting uh, with the serve bots is up there with uh, hugging the blob in the new boy in his blob that came out. <laughs> did, you, did you play that? No, I didn't. They just had a button that makes the adorable. boy hug the blob. That's perfect. It was so heartwarming. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that, uh, that, like, when you have a mechanic that is all theatrics, that's yep. the sort of thing you need to get that through. It's just those things that, like, um, when Mary plays uh, games, if you can do something that causes a little heart to come out of a character, <laughs> she will do that forever, right? Mm-hmm. Until you stop doing the heart. And if you never stop doing the heart, even if you stop giving her bonuses for it, she will keep doing it forever, <laughs> Right? Sometimes that's more important than the numbers. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so pet all the farm animals. Pet all yeah. the farm animals. Um, so yeah, that that was the mission team. Then we had to uh, we obviously scripted everything together, and we handled all the enemy setups. Um, there was a specific uh, set of combat designers, but they basically were responsible for coming up with the ideal situation for how combat would be. They'd come in and uh, kind of advise us. They'd be like, okay, right. th- here's how your space should probably change to accommodate combat or based on how combat should be across the game, this is either a great setup or you really need to work on this. 
Got it. So so uh, so they would design the enemies and the weapons, yeah? Yeah. And then uh, to figure out how they well, were supposed to work together. So they wouldn't design the weapons. They they did a lot more work on the enemies and such. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're the ones asking you all the questions in combat, right? Exactly. So they are. like, and That's why I always work on them first when I'm doing combat is because they're going to be what your combat is. Mm-hmm. If your enemy doesn't require you to do something, then you might as well not have that thing. Exactly. Uh, well, for fighting at least, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And uh, that wound up uh, working very well for the open world game. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, that's... I mean, that seems to be why everything's getting so specialized, right? It's because, uh, you know, when you're spending that much money to make a game that's that big... Exactly. You gotta... People have to specialize, otherwise it's just too much. Uh, like Skylanders, you know, we had to separate the designers into... Uh, the designers who worked on the Skylander hero characters, because we have like 30 of those <laughs> game, right? And then the, the designers who worked on the level design, you know, they were different. Mm-hmm. And then we had people specialized in doing all of the effects as opposed to doing the Skylanders characters, as opposed to doing the enemy art, as opposed to doing the, you know, like there was just all these different specializations just to get it done. You know, the people who did the toy designs were not the same people who were doing the enemy designs who were, you know, like it was, uh, it was very specialized, but very, like you were saying, interwoven so that the disciplines could give advice to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so my next question then is, you're the first person I've had on on the podcast uh, who has worked with VR so far. Yes. So what I want to talk about is what, what are the uh, game design paradigms that have to change because of VR? For example, when we went from 2D to 3D, the most important thing we learned was the camera can make people really sick if you do wrong things with it. And here's a set of best practices. <laughs> now, I understand that that's been a, a, a similar learning process with VR. Absolutely. Uh, there's only so much you can do, say, to move their head. And can you talk about things like what what are design limitations that you might not necessarily think of before you've worked on a VR game if all you've ever worked on was another game? So, so I mean, uh, honestly, tracking the things that can make people motion sick is probably the most important thing when designing for a uh, VR game. Mm-hmm. And it, it is vitally important because I know, for instance, I love the 3DS. I think the 3D is charming and frequently uh, has better immersion for the game. And I you know don't, you, you don't have a cataract in one eye. I, I know you hate it with all the passion of a thousand burning suns. It's not that bad. But if you want to turn it off, there is a tiny switch and everything works fine. Yeah. Uh, when you are making a game that is strictly... Uh, for a VR headset, yes, yes. you want to make sure that you have everyone's uh, constitution in mind. And uh, I, when you're I, jerking their heads around, yeah. Too, yeah. And I, I will be uh, perfectly honest. Like I've never had any problem with motion sickness uh, in VR. Even, even doing the things that I know can often cause motion sickness. Uh, so like, you have a pretty iron stomach. Yes. Lucky. <laughs> Some people cannot handle debugging through the world when they're wearing a helmet. But those people are super valuable because yes. they're the ones that you make play the game and say, well, that's are it. you getting sick? Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, you It's can, like the colorblind programmer or designer on the team who can tell you, can you see this? You know, Sometimes you have to have that. And the fun with motion sickness is you can never actually pinpoint what caused it most of the time because it's actually cumulative. Mm. So like, you know, you're driving through the car and you decide to... Uh, read your receipt from the grocery store if you're a passenger not driving right uh and about 15 minutes you feel nauseous yeah it's because you were reading in the car even though you're not reading at that point Mm. so uh yeah there's a lot of uh granular research to what will make people a little sick without knowing it if you you say what made you sick they're like this level and i'm like are you sure or was it the fact that you were doing a lot of backtracking early Mm. on so yeah um like for instance camera design is a huge thing uh because in most 3D games, we know that we let people move the camera. Right. That's, you know? that's just how we've made been making games for the last decade. Exactly. And even uh, games like God of War or Spyborgs, where you have a fixed camera, the camera's still moving around and the designer can choose where it faces so that it's going to actually benefit gameplay. Even in 2D games, we can scroll the camera however we want. Right. Like Mario can't move left, but he can move right. Mario, you know... Uh, right. In a, shoot, a top-down shooter game... You know, where the, where you're going, so goes the camera, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that actually makes people very nauseous in uh, 3D. So um, that is why some people do first-person games in Oculus. Uh, 
you you know the camera's going to be falling around because it's your head. Um, Edge of Nowhere um, is exploring the uh, exciting territory of being a third-person platformer. Yes, well, that's one of the one of the only people trying that, I think, yes, right now. So yes, yes. Um, breaking new ground in VR, Mark. Yeah, and we are aware of that. Uh, and, and it's pretty exciting, and uh, certainly... You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> you know, certainly imagine platforming where you actually are aware of just how high up your character is at all times where you can look down down. and see that it is not just fall to death but fall to smash all of your bones yeah Yeah. um and there's some fun things that you can play around with that like for instance imagine if mario actually could look up and see the thwomps lingering above his head and that was actually something he had to do while walking around right um but yeah you actually can't force the camera in any location in fact generally the camera is rooted right behind the player Mm -hmm. um a lot of people get nauseous once you start even blending the camera in and out from the player that makes sense yeah because if it's a subtle combination of you moving your head and it moving your head and then you don't end up where your inner ear tells you you're supposed to be exactly that could be really it's it's very much uh tied to also player input like we've we've found that uh, if the camera moves and the player didn't push a button they get really nervous Mm. so we there are things you can do uh i mean if you actually have a one second fade you can actually move the camera to fixed locations but you're not going to have the player actually just tilting the camera and it's interesting because now there are so many more things the player can actually see than they would in a traditional 3d game Mm -hmm. um like for instance being able to look up and see icicles directly above their head right or you know be cognizant of something directly behind them by just glancing over their shoulder wow and now the artists have to make all of that yeah exactly (laughs) however because the camera's fixed like Leaning over and looking over the edge that your character's standing on, like you could probably do that a lot easier if you could just kind of pull the camera in. It's not dangerous like in a third person game where you have to walk to the edge and then move the camera up and hope you don't walk off. Exactly, exactly. You can't really um, lean over the edge to see. Yeah. So, um, also, so you've got the camera trailing behind the player. You also don't want it clipping into anything. So, uh, you, you have to really be focused on the metrics and know. This is the dead space between the player and the camera. Oh, and you can't have it clip anything either. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. So. So it took an incredibly complex problem and made it complexer. <laughs> yes. Uh, but just making sure the entire team understands like all, all those limitations, um, all those opportunities, and designing around those. So here, but, here's one thing that uh, actually makes people very nauseous in VR. Walking backwards. You'll notice there's a lot of people who are in buses, if their seats are rear-facing, they get nauseous. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Same thing with VR. So, at least in, uh, we've discovered in our third-person game, like, the less you encourage people to backtrack, the better. It makes sense, because then you won't get nauseated. Exactly. Uh, Does, uh, so like in a a third-person game, or a second-person game, There's a lot that you can do with user interface that just from watching 3D movies, I've noticed is impossible in when you're doing an overlay over someone's actual 3D vision. What kind of user interface things have you run into? Well, we're... uh... Or or is that not where you are yet? No, no. I mean, so we've actually found that it's actually... You can actually do a lot of uh, 3D UI if necessary, Uh, like weapon wheels and things like that. Are you Um, talking about like that exists... In in camera space or, or they, they, they actually in the world? they float inches from the player's face. Oh. It's actually a little weird when you can kind of turn your head and peer around a around menu it a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, they are perfectly functional and actually work better than people would expect. Um, what do you we, control we're doing that with with the controller? Yeah, okay. Uh, we're doing an experiential kind of horror game, so uh, we're downplaying a lot of UI. You know, clearly yeah. there there are certain things you need it or want it for, but. Well, I mean, a lot. We of don't have a lot probably... of parts floating over people's heads or anything. But it's good to know that if that is in there, it won't necessarily be wrong. Exactly. You know I mean, you know, like, like we, we have reticules and whatnot, right. and they they work just fine. But they're all three D. Yes. So there's no two D reticles anymore. Right. Is there is there any use for screen space besides effects at this point? That might be an open ended question. <laughs> uh, it's kind of an open ended question. Um, 
Yes, potentially. Yes, potentially, <laughs> but but not for the things we used to use it for. Yeah. Um, so then one other thing, and then we can be done, and you can go home if you want. Finally, I will release you from your handcuffs. No. And you can go see your family again. Ah. Uh, so you said that uh, so this time, so the last time you were leading the mission team, this time you're leading the team. Right. Well, the, the the Burbank team. The Burbank team. Yes. Okay, yes. so... There, there is a uh, North Carolina team, and uh, Mike Daly is actually overseeing the entire design team. I love team. Mike Daly. Mike you, Daly you know is him? the best. Yeah, he started before I, I left. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, he is fantastic. I yeah. love working He's with so him. He's so chill. Isn't He's he? He's the chillest guy. Seriously. Like, whenever something... Like, the, the shit would hit the fan, things would be exploding, and he'd just be like, well, it's okay, guys, we got this. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, wow, we love you. <laughs> yeah, we hired him... Um, uh, on one of the projects, we had a bad experience hiring a senior designer. Okay. And so we decided not to hire him senior. We hired him regular. And he busted up the senior like super quick because he was so awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I liked Mike a lot. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, what, what what's the – have you noticed the difference between leading the specialist team and leading a, a, te- a team of specialist teams? Well, so – the way things are working right now, every it's a little closer to the old fashioned uh, generalism. Yeah, the the generalism, the, the cl- closer to how we did things on Fuse or Spyborgs. You sure. know, where we de- we definitely have overall layout designers that do like broad strokes of what each area will look like, but most of the designers are actually handling some of the specific layout, cover layout, uh, tweaking the spaces to fit uh, what they want to do. People get to uh, wear more than one hat. They're wearing a lot of hats. Um, and honestly... Every, it's fun. Uh, uh, yeah, and most of these people actually, uh, their hats fit very well, you know? Yeah. Well, some people are just good at multiple things. You know? Exactly. Uh, like, I remember when I was... Uh, and that changes over time, too. Like, on the Ratchet games, at first I was really good at puzzles and really bad at combat. And nowadays, I do combat more than I do puzzles, even though I like puzzles a lot, right? It just changes over time. Well, you've you've always been a Zelda stuff. man. A Zelda man, yeah. Well, do you remember when I taught you about... Uh, a, a, a room full of blocks that could only be pushed in one direction? Yes, levers. Yes. Yeah, lever. And uh, I remember you, you were like, but that's not how Zelda does it. And I was like, go home and play Zelda <laughs> and come back and tell me whether all your favorite puzzles. And I remember you came back and you're like... They're all levers that go in one direction. Yeah. When a designer designs puzzles, they usually think about three layers too far. Yeah. You know? Well, usually what you want to do is you introduce the elements of the puzzle and then just combine them in different ways so that the player uses the things they're familiar with to... Exactly. Like, uh, uh, did you play Talos Principle? I did not. It is a master class in puzzle design. If you ever want to... If you ever just want to learn how to be a puzzle designer... Play that game and just look at every puzzle because they do it perfectly. Mm. Uh, like they, they, they'll teach you a mechanic and they'll do a bunch of really cool stuff with just that mechanic. And then in the next one, like they'll teach you another mechanic and then you have to do both, right? And then it turns out that both of them together end up being greater than just – like a greater complexity than just them separately. And they all overlap in very different ways okay. so that like – one thing by itself may be very complex and another one very simple, but when you overlap the two of them, it gets very interesting, you know? So it's, uh, I thought it was a, a, a very good game, if you ever want to check that out. Uh, so that's all the topics I have. Is there anything you want to plug or say before we're done? It's okay if you don't have anything. You well, could just tell everybody that with great power comes great responsibility. I, I was going to say, uh, you know, Drink your Ovaltine. Go out there, play Sunset Overdrive again. Um, yes. You know. And buy it if you haven't uh, bought it yet. Honestly, uh, Edge of Nowhere, it's going to be amazing. I keep hearing really good things from everybody who touches it. You know, so, so do I. And I'm always happy to hear that. <laughs> Especially since you see more people who touch it than <laughs> hey, I do, yeah. The, the, there's a great video on YouTube about a uh, German game reviewer mm-hmm. that put it on. And all he's doing is sh- uh, shouting Shiza and squealing the entire time. <laughs> It's like, like that's the bar we've Freddy's, set now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for coming, Mark. Hopefully, I'll have Anytime, you back in someday. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this month's installation of the Chaotic Stupid Podcast. I'll be back next month. I think I may actually do it by myself next month, just doing on a few topics. But if I don't, then uh, I might be bringing in another designer friend, or who knows, I might even get an artist this time. An artist? Yeah. Where are you going to dig up from, one of those? From the other side. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so anyway, thanks everybody. Uh, bye. bye. Bye out there. Bye. <laughs>